Electricast. Cars say a lot about who we are. It represents freedom for a lot of people. This season on Drive, I'm going to talk to all sorts of different people. I looked at car names. Yes. A- and yes. I found all the car names that have science or astronomically it's inspired. It's crazy. It's huge. It is. Okay, yes, sure. I happen to be CEO of Ford Motor Company. For me, it's all about cars, movement, and our mutual passion for things that get us around. This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower-than-low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Westman demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. And the chick in the box. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host Iris and I'm here with my older brother. Princess Wesley. (laughs) And today we're talking a movie from 2017, The Mummy. Man, long time coming. Part of our Renaissance Fraser Fest. Mm, Negative. No? Not to be confused with The Mummy. My Crenaissance, not that he went anywhere, and Christopher McQuarrie Month. Okay, but you got to say Tom Crenaissance because Crenaissance only uses two, utilizes two letters of his last name. Well, in context of the mummy, I would think it would be obvious. Boy, is it confusing that this is called the mummy, and the <laughs> 1999 version is called the mummy. Not to be confused with the 30s version of the mummy, <laughs> or the the 60s version of the mummy. Right? Universal is keen on making sure that their property is recognized and understood. But I gotta kind of apologize to you, man. We are discussing the mummy in uh, celebration of Christopher McQuarrie Month this July here, at or whatever movies. Yay! But he's barely. <laughs> He's barely involved. So looking for Christopher McQuarrie movies to cover, uh, his name popped up as screenplay for The Mummy. And I was like, oh, he tackled the adaptation. He's like one of five writers and didn't direct this film in particular. Well, we're not necessarily recognizing Christopher McQuarrie as a director, although he is, but primarily as a writer in honor of the writer's strike, which at the time of this recording is still ongoing. Yep. Maybe one of five writers or one of six writers, him being the sixth, Maybe that's indicative of how this all played out. Yeah, that is probably the case. However, he has precedent. He had written the screenplay for Edge of Tomorrow by this point. He had directed Tom Cruise and Jack Reacher, uh, and they were actively developing the Mission Impossibles together. So he's definitely in the fold, which is why I think he's a part of this one. And I guess if you're doing a movie like this by committee, and by committee I mean a grand committee, not only of the writers but all the executives at Universal, you want your dude in there, right, to like at least put in his two cents. Okay, so like Christopher McQuarrie was like the Tom Cruise emissary in the writer's room? I think so. And amongst the execs? Yeah, well, I'm not sure about among the executives. He kind of infused his people where he could. But, you know, Tom Cruise, he's all like the good guy, like bringing people on that he champions and and is involved in in all the aspects, producing and and casting, things like that. And uh, he's very proud of all that stuff. So I think that he just tried to kind of keep it even keel. But that, as you said, this is a real problem and it's maybe a prime example of working by committee, where not all the committee is on the same page. There are legends of the Universal executives sitting in the room and couldn't agree on anything. And one of the people, I will not say who, suggested he knew that Universal's proposed Dark Universe would fail from the first meeting, because they couldn't even agree whether or not the major franchise uh, tentpoles were good guys or bad guys. 
were good guys or bad guys who was cast so at the time of the mummy they were planning this to be the lead off with the world's biggest movie star next to come was going to be it was actually going to be the bride of frankenstein in which javier bardem was frankenstein's monster uh, johnny depp was cast to play the invisible man and there's conflicting reports about whether or not russell crowe would get his own standalone film as the established here uh, henry jekyll as Jekyll and or Mr. Hyde. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's a lot of pressure to put on the mummy. It's a tremendous, it's an entire franchise. The dark universe advertising and promo and stuff, it's at the very top of this film. It simply doesn't exist in the world. They hung everything on this movie. And it ended here. So it started and ended with the mummy from 2017. That is correct. Wow. Because this is, in terms of horror, this is really what Universal has. They have Frankenstein, Dracula, the mummy, the wolfman, and that's kind of it. So they were starting off fairly light with their Avenger-style reboot of an entire franchise. And you realize kind of how weak these properties are. That's because we think of, I think of the old black and white movies from the 30s and 40s, when, uh, in fact, The Invisible Man, which is kind of what happened after The Mummy failed, uh, they went in this very Jason Bloom, really low budget, but high return formula with movies like The Invisible Man, which, uh, you know, in the scope of things, cost almost nothing to make and was hugely profitable. The Mummy, not the case. Very, very expensive. And while while it made nearly half a billion dollars at the box office, it simply wasn't enough of a foundation to support everything else that they were going to do. And your point is that maybe the monster pantheon isn't enough to support the dark universe. I mean, you're talking Dracula, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Aren't those both in the public domain? Um, yes. Uh, but again, Universal holds those images very close. And so they have to kind of keep those properties alive with their versions. I'm not sure if Javier Bardem would have been the flat-headed, bolts-in-the-neck Frankenstein style <laughs> or whatever, but anyone can do it. I think they do have some kind of a foothold on, on Frankenstein. I remember in my Mattel days that we had to get approvals from Universal for the Monster High franchise. Oh, okay. So there's at least that. So they have they might maintain the copyrights on these old movies. They might have some rights over some ownership of the other monsters. Well, so here's what they had proposed. There was going to be a Van, another Dracula, a Van Helsing, under this Dark Universe banner specifically, probably a Wolfman. But then at least for the ones that they initially cobbled together, the Invisible Man, uh, probably Dr. Jekyll and or Mr. Hyde and for the Frankenstein's monster in along with Tom Cruise, they were going to make, and I'm not kidding, the Dark Army, which pulls this team together to stop something evil. Good? I don't know if they were good guys or bad guys, but there was <laughs> going to be an Avengers-style monster team-up called the Dark Army. Wow. The ill-fated Dark Army. You can kind of see what happened. <sighs> So are you bummed? Like, is there still a little part of you that wished that this had come together? I was wrong. I did not believe that the Avengers would work because I thought Thor was going to be a dumb superhero. I was like, Captain America? Seriously? I was wrong because it came together in at least Endgame and, and Infinity War are up there among the top grossing movies of all time. But I never saw the promise of the Dark Universe. And this is not to say that I prognosticated the ultimate demise of this franchise, but it's just these seem to me like lame properties. And yeah, we're going to do a dozen movies and pull them together over decades, Marvel style. It's like, okay, good luck with that. I need to be convinced. I wasn't on board. What was it like revisiting The Mummy from 2017? this time around a little bit of trepidation but it was kelly ray's first time seeing this movie so that is always interesting and i forgot that this is not because when you think of the mummy at least i think contemporary audiences given brendan fraser's resurgence in popularity his mummy movies were fun they were indiana jones style super heightened cartoony action movies that were, you know, sw not swashbuckling, I guess, but torch bearing and, and, and fun, whereas Tom Cruise's mummy was not that thing. So I remembered being underwhelmed by the movie, but I did want to see what her reaction is. Actually, our, our strongest link to Christopher McQuarrie month for this movie is that Kelly Ray pulled a me style Christopher McQuarrie trick and predicted this movie. 
you're referencing you being able to identify Kaiser Soze within the first few minutes of the usual suspects. Exactly. So they're walking into the room in shadow and at the head is a conspicuous looking silhouette. And Kelly goes, is that Russell Crowe? <laughs> Is Russell Crowe in this movie? And I was like, what? And she's like, that looks like Russell Crowe hair. Is that Russell Crowe? And I was like, that's Whoa. Russell Crowe would be in there. That's stupid. And then he like shows up and she like looks at me and her eyes are all full of pride or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> and she's like, I totally called it. I totally called Russell Crowe just from his hair. Russell Crowe hair? I didn't even know that he had distinctive hair. Yeah, he has that dumb little haircut. It's like a Simon Cowell haircut. A little parted in the middle, yeah. like pseudo-British haircut, even though he's Australian. <laughs> right. Um, well, it wasn't necessarily a spoiler, although it was somewhat of a reveal that he was Dr. Jekyll. I mean, but weird. Like, yeah. I just didn't understand the connection between Dr. Jekyll and the mummy. I mean, he was going to be a part of the universe, and I think he was going to be the Nick Fury character. He was going to be the one that pulled them all together. But that also may be why it failed, because you can't rely on the unreliable dude. He, Dr. Jekyll is the least responsible team leader ever. Yeah, shouldn't he just get those injections or whatever on a timer? Yes, he should. Not only that, he should set his timer a good 10 minutes before that injection is necessary. <laughs> because the one time that, that Tom Cruise swipes the thing, within 30 seconds, he's Eddie Hyde, all cockney and trying to beat him up. Yes. That said, in a weird way, I was really looking forward to seeing that scene again. Because I think Russell Crowe is a good actor. And as kind of silly as it seems that he would be this major character or whatever... I think he has real presence and he was scary, even though he kind of turned blue and his eyes kind of turned yellow and he did like a weird monster voice. I think he is actually threatening. And in the Mission Impossible movies, Tom Cruise would just walk through him like Alec Baldwin or something. But he seemed tough, even though he's kind of a chunker and uh, he was gladiator for God's sake. Yeah. And this was kind of the beginning of everybody's gladiator chunking out. But Tom Cruise was looking extra buff in this movie. Really? Don't you think? He Did he do shirtless? Oh, he did. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's because he was shirtless. But he was definitely yoked and is still definitely yoked. Yeah. At 61 and touring the world to promote the Mission Impossible movie, this guy's got stamina. Yeah. He's got to promote Dead Reckoning Part 1 while still shooting and completing Dead Reckoning Part 2. They're still in principle, wow. I think, for that movie. Busy man. But at the top of his game, Brian said, quote, not as bad as I remembered it. About the mummy? The mummy. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess that was a good thing, but it also might suggest like that it was pretty disappointing right off the top. I think that it was considered such a spectacular failure at the time because they were so there were such high expectations and so much pressure, so much writing on this movie to open, to launch, to perform. But I think if you remove all that pressure, you kind of watch it for what it is. It's all right. It's not any worse than some of our bombs this summer. This wasn't so much a budgetary failure, although it didn't really make a lot of money. It just, as you said, had so much expectation, an entire franchise, and literally decades worth of, of you know planned movies and properties that hinged on its success. It couldn't have survived all the, uh, the pressure. So uh, Aminet, the hypersexualized Egyptian princess slash <sighs> goddess, chooses Tom Cruise's Nick. Why? She needed a dude. <laughs> Okay. And she knew that he was morally compromised. Yeah. But if you're go if you're moving through the ages looking for your prince or whatever, the person who's going to achieve your goal of world world domination, who better than Tom Cruise? I would have chosen Tom Cruise as well. But then she <laughs> wants to sacrifice him to make him a to make him her god, to make yeah. him set. Right. right? The, 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 the evil was going to go into him, as Henry Jekyll said. And so now I think we want to get into reasons, specific reasons, why this particular movie did not do well. Do you remember when Dr. Henry Jekyll suggested that evil was a pathogen and that it could be transmitted or he was keeping it at bay with his antivirus or whatever, his injection thing? Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. So that was wonky. But he was going to be injected or stabbed with the evil, and it was going to embody him. And I think that might have been a recurring Who? basis. Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise? Yeah. Nick was going to become what he ultimately became, which was the god to rule alongside her, except that his humanity remained and he could fuse his eyeballs together, you know, just enough so that he could kill her first. What Did he have that... <laughs> 
And did he have that eye fusion ability because he did it himself? Like, did he take something from her yes, by I sacrificing think so. himself? Right. I think he made the evil his own. And so she didn't have any claim over it? Something <laughs> like that. Did she cause the vomit comet crash? Yes. So everything went wonky because she, even from, you know, once extracted from her mercury prison, could affect things. Because already by that time, he was experiencing visions. She was controlling. It's like an RFID blocker, that mercury, and kept all her mental powers in check. But that was all vomit comet, right? It was, yes. They did over 60 parabolic flights. It looked good for what it was. I'm not sure if plane crashes are like that. Maybe in cargo planes where there's no seat belts or anything like that. But they were running, rolling from floor to ceiling and up the walls, Inception style. And uh, it <laughs> maybe could have been done on a tumbly thing. But who knows? They committed a lot to it and people were puking and all that stuff. Because that's what Tom Cruise does. He does big stunts. And I'm not sure that this one was worth all that time and money for a couple of spins. Was zombie Jake real or an apparition? Um, good question. Because his body was completely destroyed in that plane crash, I'm sure. But Tom Cruise's body wasn't. But he was shot and looked all tore up. So reconstituting him using his mummy powers... Um, <laughs> Was questionable how that worked because he seemed, he's like, oh, thanks. And he remembered all that stuff. I don't know. He was definitely an apparition, American werewolf in London style, which is no secret. It was very obvious from the start that this is an Egyptian mummy in London. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Was Jake put there by Nick? Did, did Nick conjure up Jake, or was he an ominous uh, ambassador? Yeah, I believe that there is a real world in this movie that is from beyond the grave or whatever and is spirits and mental powers or whatever. And that he was kind of held suspended by her. Like, you know, she was his he was her agent when he started st stabbing people with the rolly back eyeball. And then he was like, she has plans for you. So he was kind of an agent of her for a while until he got transferred, you know, in the coup, he got transferred to Tom Cruise's power or his office or whatever. Whatever. Okay, because he was definitely scary and kind of acting more like the other dust zombie things. Yeah. and But then he started being like his jokey, jakey self. Right, where he's the uh, Justin Bartha of this movie, if this movie were like National Treasure. <sighs> Except I feel like Jake Johnson was like, he must have felt so silly showing up every day and getting painted all gray. They probably like antiqued him with flour as soon as he stepped out of his trailer and it's like all right you're good to go put in the, the eyeball contact lens and you look scary was that a jackass reference it was that's what you call it antiquing yep you give people an old-timey antique look by by dousing them in flour <laughs> man you love jackass <sighs> I thought he was a serviceable sidekick and albeit a little silly in toward the end, like just kind of popping up and all like all jokey zombie. Yeah, he disappeared for a good long while until it was appropriate for him to pop up again. But I thought he was going to be in his ear. Didn't he say at one point, are you going to be like in my ear the whole time? Ha, huh. speaking for the audience, um, Annabelle Wallace, who played Jenny Halsey, kind of came and went. This seems like it would have been her big moment. You think so, but she made history. How so? Annabelle Wallace is the only person. And she did find some success later with uh, the Tudors, and she was in Peaky Blinders, apparently. So those are, you know, big, big things or whatever. But she went up to Tom Cruise and was like, hey, I'm going to run with you. And he was like, nobody runs with me. And she's like, well, I'm going to run with you. 
So when they're escaping and Aminette is turning the entire city into sand, she's running right alongside him. And no one has done it before or since. Wow. Does she keep up? I don't remember. Uh, sure. Because nobody runs like Tom Cruise. Right. And she kept up with him. And uh, that is her mark on history. You know, it might, seem like a, it might seem like a little thing, but Tom Cruise running in the film is a big deal. Right. And he knows it. And she she knew it and headed it off and was like, I'm going to be the one. So in the montage, in the forever montage of Tom Cruise running, maybe she'll be in there. <laughs> but uh, also well into his 50s by the time this movie rolled around. And uh, Dr. Jekyll, gray bearded Russell Crowe, was like, you're the younger man, right? Not so. Tom Cruise, like two and a half years older than Russell Crowe. No way. This movie is curious to me because it really manages to make Tom Cruise, to use Roger Ebert's word, a nothing burger. Like, I feel like the real failure of The Mummy is how they mishandled the Nick Morton character. I, and I just didn't know that that was possible with Tom Cruise. He, well, he's played unsympathetic characters before, and particularly in horror movies, but still likable. But yeah, he called Aminette the chick in the box. And we were having a discussion about how Tom Cruise would be like the womanizing one night stand, not calling type dude or whatever. He was basically Tony Stark without the charisma. What kind of dude do you expect him to be? But I think it's because this is not the Nick Morton story. And likewise, it's not the fun universe. It's not the cheerful, charismatic universe. It's the dark universe. And this movie really did play like a horror movie. And I don't think Brendan Fraser's The Mummy could, in any context, be considered horror, um, even though there were some gross-out parts and, I guess, some thrills. But it was dark, and there was really no room for the humor that Tom Cruise, a lot of the time, has good comedic timing and, and is known for. And that was... I always prefer these types of the, the direction. I want the mummy to not be funny. I want it to be dark and scary and atmospheric. But still, they were cartoon zombies, and they were CG top to bottom. That's the distinction between Jake Johnson and the other mummy henchmen, is that he was real, and they were cartoons. I think that it, it tried to be dark, it muted and muzzled Tom Cruise in the process, and then wasn't dark and wasn't scary. Like, I was more thrilled by Temple of Doom, bugs, and crawly things than I was by the horror of this movie. <laughs> Where the dusty skeletons come out and go, yeah, for right? no reason. Maybe scary when she summons the evil and he's like walking behind her all scary like i was like oh that's kind of cool but then we have the mummy herself so if you're if you're going to overshadow tom cruise for a dark movie then you need the mummy to be dark and i'm sorry this mummy not so sophie butella you know perfectly capable or whatever just not a scary mummy she weighed like a buck 10 she also spent a lot of time in the sarcophagus or in chains. She wasn't really like in the fray. She like summoned her army and like had them do her bidding or, and was otherwise just kind of tied up the whole time. It, it, I just didn't buy it. Um, there's got to be a term also, right, for like the fetishists where the, like the BDSM crowd goes nuts when she's all chained up and stuff. But it's like it's not goth, but it's like like mummy core. Like, like, <laughs> like mummy and the fetish enthusiasts or whatever. <laughs> I think the problem and some people have cited the problem with the mummy is not being scary, but rather being sexy. However, going into this, knowing that that was the criticism and having seen this movie before, she doesn't get sexy for a long time. Like it's only really towards the end of the movie where the holes in her face start to climb up. But the sexier she gets, the bandages start to drop away. But I, I think the overall effect is a feminine sexy mummy which is absolutely bizarre to me <laughs> did you see x-men apocalypse nope no nobody saw x-men apocalypse do you know that oscar isaac was the uh apocalypse character or whatever who was Love very him. like mummy like but nobody nope. saw that movie and this movie actually changed directions because it was written with a male for the mummy, who would have been scary and imposing. Saw Oscar Isaac in X-Men Apocalypse and was like, no, nah, that's too close to our mummy. Gotta change directions. Let's make it a scary lady. 
So she was, is she the titular mummy or was Tom Cruise the mummy? I'm so confused. No, I don't know. Was he ever a mummy? What constitutes a mummy? And so as we know, both of us having been to Egypt, uh, mummification is the binding with the wraps and keeping things dry so that the uh, the elements can't get in. And, and embalming. It, what was, was there embalming or was it simply wrapping? Was it draining think, of blood and all that stuff? I think it was embalm, embalming and then like oiling and wrapping. Yeah. And so keeping it tightly wrapped, i.e. not with eye holes, so you can see Aminette's fear. That's the dumbest, the worst mummification I've ever seen. It's like poking holes in your eggs before you put them in the fridge. So it was flawed from the start or whatever. But she was mummified ineffectually. But he never was. He was just had the curse. And also, I had, it has to be said that mummy is a really dumb word. And there's nothing about mummy <laughs> that inspires fear in me. Watch out. It's a mummy. They basically just transposed it to mean zombie here. Basically. And, and, and mummy only exists, I think, in popular culture because, well, there were the movies way back in the day. And because it was the cheapest Halloween costume, right? You can wrap your kid in toilet paper <laughs> and all of a sudden they're a mummy. And if it starts to unravel, then great. You have a mummy type effect. But mummy is not scary. And him, him being... I think they should have called it like the curse of the pharaohs or something like that. Yeah. Or whatever. Agreed. So she was meant to be the pharaohess, but then her dad had a kid who was a boy and she got bumped from the line of succession, right? And so she summoned evil to kill the baby and the dad or whatever. Um, and then Tom Cruise got this evil in him and what well, he's not going to be Pharaoh or anything. He's just like a nomad in his little rap. But no, he's not a mummy. He's just the evil. Exactly. Why does the fact that he has become the evil have zero weight? Probably because he rides off into the desert on an adventure. And I was like, wait, what? So let's wrap this up with... Christopher McQuarrie. Do you feel like this has any Christopher McQuarrie hallmarks? I mean, there are some elements. Edge of Tomorrow, it plays pretty closely that he gets infected by this thing, but is, is also trying, has to try to stop the monster that gave him this terrible gift when he gets the blood of the Alpha from Edge of Tomorrow. Because it's not twisty turny in nope. a quintessential McQuarrie style. But maybe this is kind of later years, Christopher McQuarrie, you know, action set piece interstitialer. What I think this movie is doing is pulling together the elements that they're, it, it's setting up everything, right? Dr. Jekyll and everything moving forward. When we go through his lab, you see the hand from the creature from the Black Lagoon and the vampire skull. And all these things are meant to suggest that there's a larger world out there that we're going to inevitably explore in the dozen movies to follow. And it's Christopher McQuarrie's and the writer's job to plant those seeds throughout, to pull together all the elements into a cohesive story, where in the mummy story, you're like, what is Dr. Jekyll doing here? This is weird. Um, I think there's also something of the horror being lost in updating it when you are in the world of her world of 1127, when all the stuff is happening, maybe it was scarier, but when you're in like present day London and there are double decker buses and stuff and and like people in Toyotas and junk and then there's like a mummy chasing them through town or a sandstorm you're like yeah it's not scary it's it seems it's too contemporary I think it was just mm. it's the, like pulling this all together these ancient evils into a Dracula in the modern era type of vibe like the BBC one um, mm -hmm. And maybe that was his strength. Like, hey, we got to get a lot of people because there's a lot of balls in the air here and we have to keep them all in order and keep it somewhat coherent. He's good with big, sprawling, complicated problems like this. If their partnership, Tom Cruise and Christopher McQuarrie's, can survive the mummy, seems like there's something there. Yeah. There's something lasting and enduring there. He definitely sees something in Christopher McQuarrie. Tom Cruise has his failures and he takes his lumps and he keeps on getting back into the cockpit. Uh, he finds a kinship in someone who, as we discussed before, will let him do the crazy stuff that Tom Cruise wants to do and is also very capable in the writing and directing. Tom Cruise himself is known for his all hands-on approach or his hands-on approach in being involved in pretty much every aspect of movie making. And uh, it seems like Christopher McQuarrie is the same way. And so when there's a big complicated thing and a lot's writing on it, he brings in his buddy. But at the same time, you know, neither of them look back on this one as 
a major stepping stone in their collaboration because maybe they kind of got out of this one unscathed and Universal was left holding the bag. They're definitely the two big survivors from the mummy catastrophe, if I could be so bold, and saw incredible success with Top Gun Maverick and a great follow-up with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. And your final rating for The Mummy is? Not as bad as I remember it, but I was kind of bored. And for a movie that's supposed to be this action-packed, dark, scary, uh, fun, adventurous, it kind of aspired to those things and never really reached any of them. It just never quite got there. Mummy was all right, but not really in a good way, just because I can't find the fault in it that everybody does. I just thought it was bland. It sits right on the line. It was a bit of a nothing burger. Nothing burger. Still, you know what's awesome? Burgers. With pickles. And it, No, absolutely not. But if you're like, that was the worst pizza I've ever had, people are still like, yeah, but you had pizza. I've had some pretty bad pizza. Yeah, but it's still pizza. <laughs> it's like the Chuck E. Cheese of pizza. Yeah. Kind of terrifying, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> no, <laughs> for the wrong reasons, right. Definitely not terrifying. <laughs> Sorry, it's below the line for me. And that's our discussion on The Mummy. You got a boring from Iris and a straddling the line between all right and whatever from Wes. This is part of our Christopher McQuarrie month here at Or Whatever Movies. Check out our other reviews, including The Usual Suspects, Mission Impossible Fallout, and The Way of the Gun. Every summer we do a themed month. Last year we did Nicolas Cage month, and the year before that we did James Cameron month. So check out those episodes and 200 plus others at orwhatevermovies.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you enjoy our podcast, leave us a review or maybe even join our Patreon campaign and become a movie friend, which gives you the privilege of being able to request your own discussion here at Or Whatever Movies. 818-835-0473 is our hotline. Send us a text or leave us a voicemail or whatever movies at gmail.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of The Mummy. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Lessa Cadet, host of her Extraordinary Life by Design podcast, where we celebrate women who are shaping their lives one extraordinary day at a time. I speak with women from all over the world about what they do and how they are passionately pursuing their dreams and creating meaningful impacts on their communities. So come join us and learn about all there is to learn about these extraordinary women. Today is working for me. Do you believe that for yourself? Hey, I'm Pastor Julie, and I want to empower you through encouragement, inviting you to my podcast, Big Truth Encouragement, where I unpack living a faith-filled life. I created my podcast for the ladies, but gentlemen, you'll gain something too. So I invite you to listen to Big Truth Encouragement on Electricast and any platform where you listen to your podcast. Electricast. Electricast.